use the session chairs. And, and, the, and the drive set is okay? Yeah, okay. I think everything is fine. I'm going to start the, uh, record the session with your permission. Okay, okay, please. Okay, okay thank you very much. Uh, so today we have a very distinguished uh, scholar uh, from England who will deliver his uh, important talk. So by, I would like to introduce the session chair who will preside this important session, Professor Dr. Carl Anderson from Lulu University of Technology. Uh, me and Carl working together for the last 10 years and he's a great researcher and he's going to be Dean of his faculty from January, uh, 1st January, 2022. Uh, and uh, so let's uh, uh, welcome Professor Carl Anderson. And I, and as well as we have another session chair, Professor Dr. Fazal Hassan Siddiqui. So now I request Carl to take over the control of, of the session. Professor Carl, please. Thank you, Professor Torshada. Thanks a lot for the kind introduction and thanks a lot for having the opportunity being here with you. It is my task to uh, share the session and we have a very nice keynote coming up by Professor Mark Nixon. He's a fellow of IET, he's a fellow of IAPR and also a British Machine Vision Association Distinguished Fellow. He is a professor at the um, University of Southampton in Electronics and Computer Science. And the title of his talk is A Future of Biometrics. So please join me in welcoming Professor Mark Nixon on the stage. Well, thank you very much for your, uh, um, for your kind words and, um, and lovely to be here at, um, at, uh, at your birthday party <laughs> for Bangladesh and the founder of Bangladesh. Um, it's um, my great pleasure to be here at the uh, fourth international um, industrial revolution conference and um, when I was reading about Bangladesh last night, I did notice that you had a train before Japan had a train. And so let's keep that spirit of advanced technology going. Yeah? And uh, so I'm going to talk to you about the future of or a future of biometrics. So because it is a future, I've got a, I've got a question mark there as well. Yeah. And um, what I'm going to aim to do is I realize that some of you might be experts in biometrics, but I realize that some of you might be experts in another field as well. And so I'm going to try and talk to everybody. So there should be something there for everybody and uh, to talk about research and where it's going. And of course, biometrics and where is biometrics going? This new technology that we, we have really as part of our daily lives now. And, um, I was, I became part of biometrics in about 1985 when I started to work at Southampton. It's a long time ago. And um, the word biometrics didn't exist. And uh, when I started, I was unsure I would ever see this technology in the real world. And now, 35 years later or more, um, I, I, it is that. And wow, crikey. Yeah? So, it's a good time to reflect on where did we start? Where are we going? Where have we been? And, um, and that sort of thing. So that's what I'm gonna talk about. And um, I'm gonna start with what is biometrics? You know, how does this stuff actually work? And um, this stuff, really, I'm gonna say, let's, let's try and identify a single person in Southampton. Now, Southampton is not a, an enormous English city is quite small, really. Population of 300,000 people with a very good football team and a very good cricket team as well. <laughs> now, that person we're going to find is older than 21. And there's that take the chance of that is about a fifth. So that reduces the population to 60,000. If I take another measurement, that person is male. And half of the people in Southampton are males, so that reduces the population to Southampton to 30,000. And as I introduce more measures, I'll focus down on that person. Now, I'm sure you can guess who that person might be. 
um, because that person is sort of whitish and uh, that's two thirds of the population. And that person comes from the north of England. And uh, because he's from the north, there's not as many people from the north down in the south. So the chance is quite small. And that focuses the population, the uh, remaining population a great deal. When that person's taller than average and he's much slimmer than average because he cycles a bike a lot and he has non-manicured or COVID hairstyle. And as you can guess, that person is myself. Now, with seven, just seven measurements, and these measurements are pretty coarse measurements, then we can focus down to that single person. If we had a bigger population, say the population of London, we would need more measurements and they would need to be greater precision. And then we could again focus down to a single person. And that's what biometrics is about. It's about generating measurements which allow us to recognize a single person. And these days, and when I started, as I mentioned, it was a long time ago. I was I was much younger then. And um, the um, the computers we had were probably not as powerful as a modern doorbell. And um, I had the idea that you could recognize people from images of their face. And so uh, I put the faces into my <laughs> PDP-11 computer over on the right. It had 64 kilobytes of memory. Oh, those were the days. And I took pictures of my secretary and one of my MSc students. And I showed how I could measure the spacing between the eyes for recognizing their face. I mean, it's a long time ago, 1985. Now, of course, I work in the real world and if I use my phone and oh, it's disappearing with the cutout. But I use face recognition on my phone all the time to access my phone. I, I used to use a fingerprint before on my older iPhone. In Japan, you use finger vein to access your banking systems. In England, you walk through automatic gates to uh, enter the country. We see biometrics all the time. And I think it's fantastic, really. I'm, I'm one of the luckiest guys around. I've seen a technology mature to affect the whole world uh, from the beginning. And I was there at the beginning when there were 10 people working on face recognition. Now it's the subject of many people's work. But we're still moving forward with biometrics. We're not finished yet, just because we produce systems at work. We're actually exploring a new space, and that new space is how can we work out who those people are? So I've got a couple of images of somebody's here, ear here. This must be the uh, ugliest biometric ever. <laughs> the ear is horrible, isn't it? In fact, it's me and my wife. And we, in our recent paper, we showed how you can, which bits of the ear you can recognize for a male and a female. And surprisingly, women and men have different ears. Obviously with women, this bit down here, this bit at the bottom of the ear, that's where jewelry appears. But I don't know what happens with men up here. And uh, men tend not to wear jewelry at all, certainly not my age, uh, but we can recognize that this area gives us the gender in a male and this area gives us a gender in a female. And you have gender associated with your fingerprint. You have gender associated with your gait. Obviously, you've got gender associated with your face. But we're finding now that there's many more things that we can understand about biometrics. Now, I might be waxing perhaps slightly too lyrical because not only do we have biometrics, but still in my pocket, I've got my key. If I had come to Bangladesh, which I'd love to have done, but I'm sorry, I'm here sitting in, in the cold of England, um, <clears throat> I would have used my passport. And of course, to access my computer, I use my password. So in a sense, as biometrics failed, it's not there all the time. I don't have face recognition on my machine. I don't, I have it on my phone. <coughs> we do have biometric passports, but we have passports themselves. Whereas with biometrics, we should not need a passport. 
you and your body, your face, your hand, your fingerprint. That is you. That is personally you. And that should let you in. Now, biometrics is about people. So it's always in the news. And uh, every time I give a talk, I can just go into the news and pick stuff out. Because people are interested in this. Because <clears throat> we're all unique. We know we are. We're people. We're human. And the other thing is that identification is central to our lifestyle. We have to always know who we are, perhaps for security, but also for access to various things. <clears throat> and we want that um, we want that to be fast and convenient. We want it to be secure. <coughs> Sorry, I've suddenly just got a frog in my throat. <clears throat> and we want to use it everywhere we can. <clears throat> now, when we ask, where is this technology going? <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> the question is, are you in industry or are you an academic? And um, in industry, <clears throat> or in um, government, you want to know how things work. In academe, we want to take things forward. And when we take things forward, we take them to a new place. So we're working in deep learning. In industry, you're working in old fashioned technology because you want it to work very much. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Sorry, I must have talked too loud, and that's forced my voice. And so and it's, it's made me have a, a what we call in England a frog in my throat. Now, when you look at your own vision, the question is, how much can you believe it? And this is a picture of King Charles in England. He was a king who we, we cut his head off. And when we cut his head off, because he was a very bad king, he was also very vain. And he looks quite normal here. He looks big when he's in Charing Cross. But he looks normal because he was a vain man. And he, uh, so he arranged for a very small horse. He arranged for a small man. So he looks normal. <coughs> and that deceives us. We think he's uh, a much bigger man than he is. Now, look at this. Look at this cross in the center of the picture. Look at this cross. This will make you disbelieve your human vision. Look at that cross. Keep staring at the cross. Now, what happens? It's surprising, isn't it? The, um, though those dots turn green um, before they turn and uh, before they disappear. Now, in fact, they, um, they're just static. It's just, we're just removing one dot at a time. So they appear to move. <clears throat> but when they appear to move, they appear to disappear. So your human vision can be tricked. I can make it, things disappear. I can make things change color. It's amazing how you can fool computer, human vision. So let's see how good is your computer, your human vision. Now, I just want to um, see the chat screen here because I'm going to ask you ask you a question, yeah? And um, let me uh, see it here. Uh, chat, good. <clears throat> Is that ear? Put your hands up in the chat or... Oh, there's some people in the lecture theatre. Oh, if I had a picture of you, I would be asking you to wave your hands, yeah? Um, is that a man or a woman? Now, put your hand up if you think it's a man. Anybody's hand going up? No, no. How about a hand up if you think it's a woman? Yes, there's some hands going up. Very good. It's a woman, yeah, because there's an earring here. That's Sophia Loren, very beautiful, long time ago. Now, this ear here, let's go for a slightly harder one, yeah? 
no earring now, is that a man or a woman? Do you think that that person, that ear belongs to a man? Any hands going up? Hands going up? Do you think it's a woman? Any hands going up? No. Okay, yeah, well, it's George Clooney. Now, you might see that because he was quite grizzled and he has grey hair. So let's go for a younger person. And with younger people, it always gets harder. <clears throat> there's, a, there's an ear. Now, is that a woman or a man? Who goes for a woman? Any hands going up for a woman? Yeah, OK. Go Wingo's put his hand up. Anybody else? OK, does everybody else? Oh, yeah, OK. Mufti is, is saying it's a lady. Does anybody think it's a man? Anybody going to vote for a man? I should have prizes here. If I was in a lecture theater, the lecture theater with you, I'd perhaps give you prizes. Yeah. <clears throat> well, well done to the two who, who guessed. That is Emma Watson's ear. But there's not as much uh, information there. She's got short hair. Men have short hair. She's got no earrings. Men have no earrings. Yeah, so it could be a man or a woman. But I bet none of you looked at this bit of the ear for a woman and this bit of the ear for a man, because I didn't either. I know exactly that's where gender is concealed, but I don't really know what I'm looking at. And biometrics tells us what we're looking at. And biometrics reveals which bit of your fingerprint is unique. And um, it's amazing, isn't it? That there's bits of you that are unique by different measures. Now, there's also your ear tells you how old you are. With George Clooney, you can see these bits here. You can't see it as much with these two because they're younger. But people's ears are the same. The father and son have similar features. Mother and daughter have similar features. It's amazing that your ear actually encodes a great deal about your identity. <clears throat> this part of the human face that you never look at sorry, the human head, you never look at it at all, actually has a lot more information. And it's partly a question of training. Um, human performance is not uniform. Normally, we're in the middle. It's the Gaussian curve, hence the normal distribution. And when you look at face recognition, some people can't recognize even their own mother, that's prosopagnosia. On the other end, there are super recognizers and they can recognize anybody anywhere. Incredible performance. But we're all in the middle. And uh, but you can train to improve your performance. And that's part, part of what we're seeing with biometrics. And in India, they have an enormous uh, rollout of biometrics, enrolling the whole population of one of the largest populations in the world. And everybody's got it for access to money and social security. It's fantastic stuff. So we're seeing biometrics coming around. <clears throat> so the question is then standards. You know, we watch, well, I watch the cricket and I watch England not doing very well today. And we use Hawkeye. And Hawkeye tells us, was that man like before wicket? But there's no performance evaluation of Hawkeye that we see, which is quite surprising. We really want somebody to take a cricket ground and put some stumps in the cricket ground and show us that that ball is really hitting the stumps. And that's the same with biometrics. So people at NIST, that's the American Standards Institution, took a load of biometric algorithms and they applied them in a scenario, which was just like um, a you see as you walk in through an airport. So. They just took a load of people and pretended they were in an airport. And the question was, how well does this stuff do? And they took a load of algorithms. You can see they're all anonymous because you would lose confidence in the manufacturer if you did. And look at the range of performance. The best performance is zero. So one performance got to 0 0.081. The worst performance is 1.0 and quite a few hit that 1.0, which is very poor. So there is a lot of debate, and that's partly why it's in the news, uh, because the question is, how well is this stuff actually doing? And there's a long history of spoofing biometrics. It's called presentation attack de detection. 
in a way, COVID, we're all wearing masks. That gives us a new avenue for spoofing because we're not making as intimate contact with the subject. A long time ago, a guy in Japan, uh, Matsumoto, they produced a fingerprint in a mold. And um, they found, and people found that you could spoof fingerprint systems just by breathing on the sensor, which activated the last valid fingerprint. Can we use a mask? Can we use a mask all over the head on an iris? Can we use a contact lens? There's lots of ways of spoofing different, um, different people or pretending to be somebody else. <clears throat> so somebody sent me this, these two pictures here, yeah? And uh, just keeping the uh, conversation going, do you think these are the same person? Do you think yes or no? Are they the same person, yeah? Um, yeah, he's wearing a mask. It's COVID times. Anybody think that they're the same person at all? Or do you think they're different? Anybody going to make a guess? Same or different, yeah? Um, right. Go on, Attica. Same. I think I saw your lips say same. Yeah, okay. I couldn't hear you. The, um, right. Now, it is actually Castro, who's the uh, president of, uh, or was the president of Cuba. I can't remember. And he was sent to me by a Cuban. And he saw this guy appear in front of a crowd. And he thought, are they the same person? And um, the hint is, of course, to look at the ears. And when we look at the ears, this person who appeared before the crowd, claiming the identity of the president of Cuba, we don't think he's the same guy because there are some very marked features on his ears which are not present in this guy here. We would actually need more ear, more pictures of this guy to be more sure, but there are some features we were quite surprised by. Um, that uh, There's a Darwin's tubercule, which is a, a particular feature of your ear. Uh, which this guy hasn't got yet. So it's a bit of a giveaway. <laughs> anyway, it's quite interesting, isn't it? Because he thought he would put a mask over his face and he could pretend to be somebody else. But yet there's a biometrics guy who looks at um, the picture and says, oh, actually, you haven't noticed that you've, you've left your ear there. And I don't think you're the same guy. Um, right, so... In, um, there was a particularly nasty murder. Um, I think it was committed by some Israelis uh, of some guy, and they pretended to be other. They stole the identity of these people. Uh, they pretended to be somebody else. And we thought that was a good thing for biometrics. And not only did they just um, try and spoil the system, they actually tried to take the identity of somebody else. And uh, it was actually not inspired by that at all. That's just the academic talking. That's when we write our papers. We just noticed that Kevin Bowyer, who's a very a friend of mine, who's a very big name in biometrics. We just Kevin noticed... gave a keynote today. Oh, did he? Yeah, well, we he noticed... mentioned about you as well. <laughs> <laughs> we noticed that Kevin appears in all the biometrics databases. So if you want to pretend to be somebody else, all you have to do is to pretend to be Kevin. And then you'll be allowed into any biometric system because they've all been evaluated on images of Kevin. Isn't that funny? He's, he's also talked today. <clears throat> so we called it targeting. And we find Ramachalapa is a big name in biometrics too. We found there are people who are similar and you can pretend to be somebody else. And if you look at them carefully, you can actually see features which are quite similar. You look at this guy around the nose. Uh, yeah, around the nose is quite similar between the two. So in, a, in biometrics, we, we plot these using a rock analysis. And the rock analysis is worse when you go away from the origin. It's best when you get to the origin. When you target, you can make performance worse. And in fact, uh, you know, the optimum is down here. Here is a baseline system. We took a uh, published system. We then uh, spoofed it and that made it worse. We then had added an anti-spoofing system, which took us to here. And then we attacked it by pretending to be somebody else. So we can make performance go this way and that way by playing with the equations which are inside. 
our biometric system. In fact, we did Z norm <coughs> normalization, and that um, improved matters a great deal. And there's a lot of biometrics in forensics, and that's a really new area for biometrics to go. And I think that's a big area for biometrics. The difference between normal forensics and biometric forensics <coughs> is that in biometrics, we have big databases, whereas in normal um, forensics, they just have one person. So Anil Jain wrote a paper about can biometrics aid forensics, and he showed convincingly how they do. We took biometrics and uh, there was a murder, a, a vile murder in Australia, where this guy pretended to be somebody else. And he cased the joint in the morning. And then in the afternoon, he came back with his, his um, identity disguised. And we could provide the evidence which was provided to the court, which showed that these two people were the same. And the evidence, when this guy was presented with the evidence, he just said, I'm guilty. And he didn't go through the court. He was hoping he'd get a reduced sentence, which doesn't matter. He, he got 25 years. So um, um, that's biometrics in a, a fantastic use. And I think there's a lot of use in that in the future. And of course, in, in when we do that, we'll be using gate and uh, Gate fits with human knowledge. I get, I'm sure you can guess that this person here, the age of that person here, this comes from the team in Japan who Attica is working with at the moment from Yasushi Makahara. Um, this person is four years old. And when you see another person, um, this, this chap here, <clears throat> he's a bit older. But he's Japanese and in Japan, they live a long time. And um, so that person, many people would guess it's 72. But that person is actually 82 years old. But a bit like the ears we had before, this, la this lady, clearly a lady, um, she's harder to guess. And um, she's actually 34 years old. And uh, when you're in the middle ages, it's much easier to get, harder to guess. Sorry, I said easier. <clears throat> and how would a computer do? Well, a computer gets 95%. Humans get about 70 odd percent. A computer would get 95%. Human computers are much better at working out your age because they see different things from those, the things that you use for, from your human vision. And where is biometrics going? Well, another one is marketing. Can we market stuff? And uh, one of my PhD students, he worked on finding attributes which describe people. Here's a male, here's a female, here's a male, that's actually me. Gets me as much younger, it's very kind. Um, but we can work out from this video where you can't even see people's faces. We can work out how old they are. We can work out their gender. We can actually work out a great deal more. And we can actually recognize you from that video using these uh, descriptions. And he got a PhD, he, his PhD, he wanted to sell it for forensics use, and he ended up selling it in marketing. He's got a startup and he's using biometrics in marketing, um, which is great. And, you know, the, um, there was a load of marketing where they recognize you as you walk in Piccadilly Circus. But that, of course, affects your privacy as well. So people um, are worried about biometrics and we have to share that concern with privacy as well. The, um, what is the future? You know, is it um, old fashioned uh, pattern recognition or is it deep, that's newer? Should we just take the most popular biometrics, face, iris and fingerprint and make them better? Or should we use different bits of the human body? That debate is ongoing in biometrics. Should we just use one majority or should we just stick them together? These things alone allow you to achieve recognition. Why don't we fuse them? And there's a lot of biometrics fusion. 
And also we do as humans, and I'll mention this in a second. I've only got a couple of minutes, so I'm going to zoom through my last slide. Um, <clears throat> is it semantic? That's human, yeah. But there's also behavior and movement, yeah. But then there's a question of whether things work or fail and how they work or fail. And of course, will it be driven by application or will it be driven by um, commercial needs? And there's a, there's a deep feeling in <laughs> biometrics. Deep fake worries us a great deal. Deep fake gives us severe problems. And, uh, but we're working on ways to destroy it so we can tell when somebody is being faked. So I'm going to spend just one minute, really, on the last bit, which is using human descriptions to recognize you from really adverse video like this. And we decided that we couldn't use gate. We clearly can't use face. We can't use gate because there weren't enough frames. So we just used human descriptions. And this is the newest work <clears throat> that we've done. We have eyewitness statements and images. And we learn the relationship between the eyewitnesses statements and the images. And we learn them using deep learning. So we take a database of images. We have a set of labels. We crowdsource the process and we rank them that's in um, <clears throat> computer science then we use deep learning to learn the label structure having learned the label structure we then do recognition but having done recognition we can then generate new labels so we biometrics has moved to a semantic space now and we can recognize you from human description so i'm going to just zoom through this and <coughs> not describe it at all um, it's described in the top journal in computer vision or top journal in computer science TPAMI 2019 you can do this human description you can do it on the body you can do it on the face you can do it on the clothing as well and of course the one of the futures of biometrics is fusion so we fuse the head the body and the clothing and hopefully we put this guy in jail because this girl was never seen again. This picture was taken the day she was abducted. Presumably she was murdered. This guy is probably still walking around. And if we can put him away, well, I think that's a great use of biometrics. So we've shown how we can do it with these human labels. And we do it at different distances, close, medium and far. When things are far away, when things are close, we use a face. When things are far away, we use the clothing. In between, we use everything else. So there's lots of limits of knowledge I've mentioned here. You know, gender, we can get a lot more from the biometrics. We can get more than you expect from images of different parts of your body. You can even work out who somebody's going to vote for. Um, there's a lot to go. And I think there's a, there's a rich future for biometrics, even if we now have biometric systems which affect everybody around. <coughs> so biometrics might be a solved problem. I think it's not a solved problem. Can we replicate human vision? I'm not sure. Human vision can easily be fooled. We don't want to fool biometrics. There's always going to be concerns on performance and privacy because this is identifying you. And we want to help crime, to solve crime. But in future, we'll look at medicine too. I think a lot of the future is a question of identity science because we've shown that we can look at these images and reveal more than you expect. And any of the results I've shown, of course, are not mine. They're, they come from my students and uh, they, they do all the work. I'm just the boss. And of course, you can read about some of this in my books. So with apologies that... Um, I forced my voice too much and then made me cough. Uh, thank you very much. <coughs> so I'll stop the sharing now, yeah? So we thank Professor Mark for an excellent overview going from the early times until where we are now. I'll open up for questions, comments. May I? We, yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, it's a wonderful one. 
as always. <laughs> so yeah. lots of insight in your uh, presentation, uh, indeed. Uh, just, uh, I have, I mean, uh, four or five different questions. So I'll ask one. If somebody else doesn't ask, then I'll go for another one and so on. So um, number one is like, the gender is easy from different biometrics, but uh, age range, especially uh, we, are, we have been working on sensor-based as well as vision-based, we find that mid-range, we cannot decipher. Like if we consider 10, 10 years, 10 years as a band, we find that yeah. middle age, it's very difficult to, I mean, uh, uh, find one to another. So this is uh, one point. So do you think that face-based age and gender and gaze-based age and gender recognition can be merged together, some kind of fusion, and that will give better result, especially outdoor? Yeah, you, there's always, I mean, if you've got two measures, you can always fuse them. As long as you have uh, an estimate of the uncertainty attached to the two. Uh, I think, but the thing about that is, of course, people tend to believe the face, but I don't think people realise how difficult face recognition actually is. And, um, and there's actually more information in some of the other biometrics. And I, I don't think we've ever answered that question as biometrics people as well, because it depends on the system and, and how it's done. So we've got a lot more to do. And I think you're, you're right to remind me that we, the 95% is getting it in 10 year bands yet. It's not 95% getting it one year, plus or minus one year. You're absolutely right, yeah, and I should have said that. So yeah, I think there's future to go. And, uh, you know, what is age? Some people aren't, don't appear to be old, but that's often our face. But do they appear to be old by different biometrics? I don't know. Nobody's un answered that question. And I, I look forward to reading the papers on it. Interesting. Yeah, Maybe we can chop in uh, Professor Faslul and then go back to Professor Artikul. Sure. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Professor Nixon, for a very nice and informative presentation. Yeah, I'm actually not from uh, this field, but well, I mean, I, um, uh, with, with very few knowledge, I have some very basic question like, um, I mean, do you think is there any connection between uh, biometrics and behavior analysis since you have done a very nice work both in both fields, both in biometrics and behavior analysis? So, I mean, does behavior analysis helps in, uh, say, disambiguating the detection or for better performance in biometrics, mm -hmm. especially in the higher order uh, derivative of the position, such as uh, you have worked on acceleration, jerk, snap, or pop, something like that? Absolutely. Well, I think this is an explored space, yeah. The, um, I was on television once, and they wanted me to um, explain intentionality, yeah? and they wanted to me to say that I could work out what somebody's intentions were, presumably to bomb somewhere um, <clears throat> from their gate. And my answer was, no, I can't do that because I can't think of an experimental scenario where I'd be prepared to test that. I wouldn't allow them in my laboratory. But we do have a greater understanding. Some people, I mean, it, and it goes to some people, they might be super recognizers on behavior. But they can look at somebody's behavior and say, oh, I don't like the look of him. And, uh, and some other people, they say, oh, he's not a threat. Whereas other people look at them and they presume that there is no threat. And so there's a lot more in this space. And I think that's what biometrics can do. We can go into this space a lot more. <clears throat> and behavior is a big one. So that's why I called the new transactions, which Kevin Bowyer was the first editor of the IEEE transactions on biometrics behavior and identity science. And we put the word biometrics uh, behavior in there intentionally, because we think there is a great future in approaches which understand behavior. So yeah, it's a very good question. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. We could, we could have a look in the chat and I can see two questions. We have uh, Galevango asking, how do gate recognition technologies differ from biometrics? Oh, the, ah, well, gate is a biometric. Yes. The, the, um, there's two forms of biometrics. One is the medical form of biometrics where you make measurements on human bodies. And they have a journal called Biometrica. 
And this journal called Biometrica, when you look at the front page, it says, some people are interested in biometrics, which are used for recognizing people. Do not send those papers to this journal. Yeah. <laughs> so we them very much. Very so good. That's one form of biometrics. The other yeah. form of biometrics is recognizing you. Yes. And uh, the, the T, Attica, and, and, and other people have shown that you can recognize people from measurements made on their gait. And their gait is a combination of the body shape and the way it moves. And you can describe the body shape and the way it moves by using computer vision. You can get sets of measurements to describe that. And therefore, you can recognize them from them. Mm -hmm. So that's when you use gait as a biometric. There's also, um, there's also um, using phone. You can use the accelerometer in your phone. So there is sensor-based modalities too. And we in we we produced a carpet, and mm -hmm. uh, we made a carpet that we could recognise you as you walk across the carpet. The idea was that uh, you would have it before you had a burglar alarm, so you would be recognised when you go in your house before as you switch off the burglar alarm. It would and it would allow you to switch the burglar alarm off. We never mm -hmm. got that far, but we did produce the world's first mm -hmm. intelligent. <laughs> Good. We had Professor Atikur commenting more or less the same. Then we had Professor Mufti that he thanks you for a very nice uh, thorough presentation and he's writing there. Would you kindly provide some more insights about where do you see the field going in terms of the usage of uh, physiological signals as markers? Well, I mean, yes, there's EEG, ECG, and then there's the gait. There's quite a few um, sensing modalities which give you a um, some recording of, of some variable. Mm -hmm. And the question is, how do you describe that variable? And so when you work on biometrics, as we did in, with gait many years ago, we were amongst the first people working on gait. The question is, how do you get a set of numbers out of that signal, which are unique for people and different from those of other people? And it takes a certain amount of time. You've really got to understand the nature of those signals and to understand where those signals have their differences from other people. When you establish that, then you get EEG, ECG, accelerometer-based stuff. But there's probably other ones there. There is actually a signal when you when you hear people, there is a signal called the autoacoustic effect, which is because your your ear is a high gain amplifier, it produces a signal which can be perceived at the outside mm -hmm. and recorded, and it can be used for recognizing you. This autoacoustic effect depends upon your own physiology, mm -hmm. and that modulates the autoacoustic effect signal. And you can recognize people from that signal. It's absolutely mm -hmm. incredible how many things about you are mm -hmm. individual. And so I suspect there's more that we don't know yet. No, no. And I look forward to seeing them. Yeah, yeah, more research is definitely needed. Thanks a lot, Professor Mark. Then back to Professor Atikor. I guess you have a few more oral okay. questions. Yeah, so yeah. please ask them. Uh, thank you very much. I mean, uh, Mark, I mean, you know that uh, abnormal gait-based healthcare applications for some disease detection, rehabilitation cases, uh, there are few, uh, not that much progress. So do you think that, I mean, um, gait-based um, healthcare applications should be explored more? Do you feel that, I mean, there are lots of scopes based on your experience? Because I, I think, thought, yeah. I think there is, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> The thing with medical stuff is you've got to get enough data. Yeah? But when you do a proof of concept stuff in medical study, you can do a proof of concept stuff with 100 people, a much smaller database and is acceptable now in biometric. And, <clears throat> but there are many conditions which are revealed. I mean, there are conditions revealed by your gait. There are con <clears throat> conditions revealed by your face. But there's other things about your face which are known to be a myth. and um, you know, is it liver spots and are, are known to be a myth? Um, <clears throat> so we've really got to explore these and show which ones work and which ones don't. 
And, uh, you know, there is a lot of interest in hell, isn't it, naturally. Yeah? So we can explore that space. But up to now, we've really been showing that these systems can work. And having shown that these systems can work, and we have systems which <clears throat> these phones are used in, what, a third of the population of the world. If that's working, where do we go next? And I think medical is one of the ones we can go to. Good. Any more questions from your side, yeah. Professor Atikur? Yeah, yes, thank you. Uh, actually, we have one work, uh, gate-based, abnormal gate-based. I mean, and uh, we used one of the data sets uh, from Sutton, I mean, from your university. So <laughs> we published the MBC, I mean, a couple of years back. So my last mm -hmm. question probably, uh, uh, or maybe more later, that uh, what are the, um, I mean, uh, most important uh, first one, two, three areas of research regarding biometrics you think uh, the new researchers should uh, explore? I mean, uh, oh, 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 oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now that's all. I, I'd be a hostage to fortune there. I am just one people. There are other people with other ideas. Yeah, of and, course. Uh, some people believe that you should take the biometrics we have and make them work better. Some people believe that you should just combine them together. Some people believe that you should apply them in different places. Some people believe that you should explore them in greater depth. And some people believe there are new biometrics. <coughs> Take one of those <laughs> as an answer. But I'm not going to say which one. <laughs> yeah. For example, I mean, uh, for example, knuckle. So finger knuckles are explored, but I really don't know that, I mean, whether this kind of uh, new, new ideas uh, will be that much helpful. For example, uh, in our lab, we are working on that single frame based uh, um, uh, age and gender estimation and so on. And when uh, one of my, uh, I mean, uh, uh, students or researchers are working on that, we find that, I mean, the false error is a huge. Uh, uh, so why do we need basically for one frame or two frames, uh, this kind of thing? So uh, so sometimes we feel that, I mean, for, for research purposes, people are exploring, but not the clear focus on which has a brighter future. Definitely, it's a challenge always, but uh, this is just my I mean, point. So you gave some good uh, three points, so definitely that would be, mm. yeah, thank you very well, much. Yeah. From personal experience, when we started the work on gate recognition, half the people in the room would say, that's a stupid idea. Yeah. I can change the way I walk just by putting a pebble in the shoe. Whereas the other half of the room would say, that's fantastic. I didn't know I had a unique walking style. The answer to the people who said I could put a pebble in my shoe is that when you do, you can put a pebble in your shoe. But there's a lot of stuff you haven't changed. You haven't changed your body shape, so we can still recognize it. But it's just interesting that there was this debate. Is this stuff good? So what I found was I found eight quotes in Shakespeare um, where Shakespeare recognized you by the way you walk. And that, that stopped people asking those sorts of questions, yeah? Because I'm just a university professor, yeah? And, um, but people believe Shakespeare. And Shakespeare was a very clever guy. And so if Shakespeare said you can recognize somebody by the way you walk, then it must be true. And um, so perhaps the answer to that is find a, a quote in Shakespeare. <laughs> no, no, you know what I mean. It, but you, it takes time for people to accept it. Yeah? And that means you have to explore, you have to have bigger databases, uh, blah, blah, blah. And, and that's what research is about, is... You, you take an idea and you have to explore everything. It's not worth just writing one conference paper. You have to explore everything. What happens with time? What happens with clothing? What happens with other people? And then, then people start to believe it more and more. And, and so now gate is quite an accepted um, biometric. Perhaps one day exactly. knuckles will be a, a, a well accepted biometric. I'm sure they're recognized by people who like boxing, yeah, because that's uh, the thing you see. Yeah? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think it just takes time. And if the consequence of those experiments shows that it does really work, then people are convinced and it just takes time. May I add another consequential question? 
regarding okay so this is about like i mean uh, most of the data sets i mean almost 100% data sets are i mean one race so the walking pattern so based on your experience do you think that i mean if we, uh, i mean uh, culturally the gait uh, can be varied so if we have a data set having i mean very mixed amount of data sets not like only japanese or only chinese like Garcia or our EID lab and others so what do you think about that like well i think um, and there is a question by uh, Galiwango on the on the chat line here. Yeah? I think this is where reproducible research really comes to an advantage because it means there is much more data available. And I, I'm a great believer in reproducible research. It is good to show that your results can be repeated reliably by other people. That is always good. And that means there's a lot more data sets around because people have to do that have to make their data available. And so, Gali Wango, you can look around and I'm not sure they're all collected in a particular web page. They might be for various technologies, but there are plenty more data sets around which are open source. Um, what you need to do is to get an enormous disk to store them all, because yeah? databases have got bigger and bigger and bigger, which is very good. And um, so I think that, that that convinces me as to the biometrics but you can also use that for fusion and stuff like that and and that is all to the good and um you know biometrics do have a a history uh, databases do have a history of disappearing often due to privacy concerns yeah and we do need to question that sort of um that argument privacy is quite a big thing too particularly with gay yeah so very nice discussions, nice uh, questions and answers. Professor Atikor, is your list of questions at the end or do you have any additional comments? Uh, yeah, I'll discuss with him later, but okay. Uh, one comment, uh, one question basically, uh, as I got the chance and for others that uh, deep learning definitely, I mean, uh, moved the gate and other biometrics research a lot for in the last seven, eight years. But uh, as we discussed that in healthcare, when we have a small domain of data sets, like 50 people or 100 people, on that case, I mean, classical, uh, uh, I mean, feature-based uh, um, approaches, uh, do you think that, it, uh, I mean, uh, the demand is there or just go to the deep learning uh, and see how, how it goes? What do you think about that? <clears throat> well, the power of deep learning is, is awesome, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but also the question now is how does deep learning work? And you see lots of papers um, investigating how deep learning actually works and, and whether it does work and stuff like that. Neural networks went through that same uh, evolution 20, 25 years ago and they were shown to fail, yeah? So we lost interest in neural networks. I've got a suspicion we won't lose interest in deep learning. But I think deep learning will learn from the handcrafted techniques. There's more refined deep learning approaches that we can have. Um, because a lot of the ways people have made the big databases are just far too simplistic, yeah? just by repeating them, adding noise and stuff like that, GANs and stuff like that. So, I mean, it's an open space and, and it's shown enormous progress. Yeah, um, Certainly, um, the work we published in TPAMI, um, his work just showed how powerful deep learning could be. And uh, we could take a video where we couldn't see your face, we couldn't see much of you at all, and we could still recognize you by correlating the human descriptions with that video. That's an incredible capability. You know, it's, it's actually crossing the semantic space two ways. And I think there's just more, and, and there's more for people to show uh, than that. And um, but the, the danger is that the computation is enormous because when I look at the results, you don't even see any error bars except for deep minds papers, yeah? And that's because they've got access to the computational power they need. And uh, so it is, you know, there is big questions about the evaluation. And when they get solved, uh, we'll go even further, even faster. Mm -hmm. So. Thanks a lot for the questions, everybody. And uh, I suggest we have a round of, uh, round, round of applause for Professor Mark for his excellent keynote. Thank you very much. <laughs>
So back to the conference organizers. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you, Professor uh, Nixon, and also Carl for chairing the session. So before concluding the session, I would like to take a, a virtual snap of the session. So I would like to request all the participants as well as the session chair uh, to turn on their cameras, please. So if it's possible. Okay, so I'm taking it now. So one. Two and three. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you, Mark. Thank you. Uh, uh, hope you discuss later uh, with you separately again. <laughs> yeah, I also think, uh, Professor Ahad Sensei and Mark has a lot of discussion. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, Mark. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not there. I'd like to sit with the students and, and chat. Yeah, yeah. Sit I mean, uh, in future, definitely, there. we'll uh, uh, try to have you uh, in person in Bangladesh, and you will enjoy. And uh, um, uh, we have ITB Computer Society, uh, very active, and uh, Shajib Shah. Uh, you can you cannot see his hair, so he's Shajib Shah. <laughs> this is one of the biometrics <laughs> that no hair and <laughs> so. Tadichai is a, uh, I mean, a young uh, uh, assistant professor and uh, uh, the current secretary of ITPLE Computer Society Bangladesh chapter and others. So, um, I mean, hopefully we'll arrange something when uh, it would be wonderful to have you in Bangladesh and uh, you can enjoy Bangladesh as well. So, I shall look forward. I shall yes. look forward. Yes, yes. And thank you so okay. much, uh, everybody. Professor Shadat, uh, thank you so much. And uh, uh, Professor Mufti from UK and Marvin, I don't know you. Where are you from, by the way? Marvin is from Brack University, I think. 